Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of MotorOne.com, and welcome to this week's edition of the Motor One Podcast. Today we'll be discussing the new Toyota GR Supra, a car we've been waiting so long for that's finally here. Joining me this week is the only person on the MotorOne.com staff who has actually driven the new Supra, Senior Editor Jeff Perez. How are you doing, Jeff? Good, John. How are you doing? Very good. So you uh, you snagged this opportunity to drive the new Supra. I'm not sure how it landed on you. I am the one who who gives out the assignments, and I think you just kind of lucked out. It was your turn, and you were available. Um, and of course, you're more than up for the task. So you got the invitation uh, to drive the Supra. Um, tell me where where was it um, that that Toyota uh, flew you all to to experience the car for the first time? So we stayed in Virginia. Um, pretty close to the track in uh, West Virginia, which is Summit Point Motorsports Park, a track that I've driven before, so I was kind of used to it. It's a good twisty little technical track. So yeah, not really a like a top speed track, but more like a like a you know good for handling, um, and lots of turns. Yeah, it, well, it depends on the configuration, but this one, uh, there's one really big back straight, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is pretty technical. They flew you out. They wanted to dine you. They uh, let you drive the car on public roads and on Summit. You write the first drive and uh, the embargo for your impressions just lifted this week. And of course, at the same time, uh, every one of our competitors, every automotive site who had gotten to to drive the car published their first drives all at the same time, uh, which was last Sunday. So it's really been, it feels like it's been Toyota Supra week uh, this week on the internet because so many people are writing about this car. So uh, the first question I have is when everyone's review came out, I noticed that it's being referred to as the GR Supra and not just the Toyota Supra. So where did the GR come from? Uh, Well, the GR came from their racing team, uh, Gazoo Racing, which they've done some other stuff with them. I know they have a Yaris in Europe, uh, the GR Yaris. Uh, And really they wanted to put that on the Supra because of its tuning specifically i guess the suspension and the steering and a lot of the the minor components that the z4 for example doesn't get they they wanted to make it known that their racing team worked their magic on this car right so you mentioned the the z4 so for those who don't know the new supra uh shares its platform and its engine with the bmw z4 but uh toyota and bmw basically took their their you know their respective cars after that point and tuned them separately so this the super gets its own tuning and it sounds like gazoo racing was entirely responsible for for tuning the the super's handling it's a it's a really great car i mean in a vacuum you sort of have to look at this car and say okay obviously there's a previous supra that has a lot of hype built up around it um and this one yeah, obviously, if you look at all the reviews, a lot of them say, does it live up to the hype? Is it worth the wait? Yeah, but you kind of have to review this car in a vacuum. So this on the road, it's super comfortable, super fun to drive, handles exceptionally well. It's just so much fun to toss around. Um, on the track, you kind of have to know what you're doing a little bit. So if hmm. you take it in too fast or if you break too late uh, and just try and you know, ham fisted into a corner, it's going to kind of buck on you. It it really needs a special touch that CEO um, Toyota made. He wanted that car specifically to be a racing car. So you have to have some experience to know what you're doing with this car. That's, I kind of like that, though, in in the age of, of so many, um, not even electronic nannies, but kind of like electronic assist devices to make us all seem like great drivers. It's nice to have a car that's a little more raw, that is a little more um, that, that takes a little bit more experience and skill to master. So, for example, we talked about the last time I was on the podcast, we talked about the 488 Pista that I drove and that car is, you know technically perfect the Ferrari, yeah right technically perfect you know you can go as fast as you want in the corner and it won't move an inch you know for the super it's different it it really takes some skill and it really doesn't do it for you it doesn't do the work for you which is nice in order to realize what you just said you know i imagine it it bit you a little bit um like what are some of the ways that you find out like oh it's not going to smooth that out for me or, or, you know, oh, I have to be, I have to be a little bit better 
in this way? Like, like, is it kicking the rear end out? Is it, I mean, did you do any, did you spin out any at all? Or, or like how, how, how far did that go? Uh, I, I'm not that much of a noob, John. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I didn't spin out, but what you, when you go into a corner uh, quickly and you sort of expect this car to just sit flat, I guess initially when you're not, you know, you, you're not sure what to experience, um, it slides a lot. You, you definitely feel the back end coming out a lot, but not to a point where it's uncontrollable. It's, ah, okay. it's fun, right? It's fun to just toss it around, but you won't be setting any lap times. The other thing when I look at it is because um, I'm, I'm famously known for not being a um, competitive or fast driver. Um, so I don't have a lot of, of seat time on the track, but I do have a lot of seat time on public roads where I like to cruise around. What was it like um, off the track out on public roads? It's such a good car. I mean, yeah. What you experience on the track, you know, you need a little you need a little driving uh skill. On the road, you can just have so much fun with that car without even thinking about it. It's so fast, it handles super well. The suspension just kind of well, it depends. I mean, whatever mode you're in, you could either just have it really stiff and really rigid and just toss it around uh or you can just cruise. I mean, it's a super nice cruiser. So. What are the different uh, modes that Toyota put in it? Um, so you have a normal mode and you have a sport mode, which are the only two. Uh, oh, I, okay. I honestly could have done with like a race mode to make it a little tighter on the track. Uh, but sport mode does a good job of keeping things tight and keeping the steering tight and the throttle pressure, you know, is immediate. Uh, in normal mode, it's just a cruiser. I mean, you can still slam on the on the gas and, and it'll get up quickly, but uh, it's just a really comfortable car otherwise. And we just wrote about this uh, this week. Car and Driver was the first to publish zero to 60 time. And I believe it was 3.8 seconds that they got it to. Yep. Now, I always like to qualify um, zero to 60 times, especially from car magazines, that they usually use a rolling start, which gives them a couple of attempts of a second um, versus a standing start. Um, but still, that is incredibly impressive for a car with uh 335 horsepower uh to do a sub four second zero to 60 so i that that legitimately impressed me yeah it's crazy i mean driving this car they tell you 4.1 is the manufacturer estimate to 60 um and you get on the and that sounds right yeah that sounds right if you're using a, a standing start uh, zero to 60 yeah and it sounds right but then you you get on it and it's like stupid quick there's no lag there's just a ton of power. I think peak torque is like 1600 RPM. Wow. Which is really That's good. Low. Yeah. And, and it, it feels super quick. So 3.8 sounds right. Like it sounds accurate. Those are the best cars though, that regardless of what they say on paper, when you're driving them, they give the impression of being faster than they really are. And it sounds like this was surprisingly fast. Like it sounds like this was faster than you expected. Yeah, it was. I mean, I've driven some cars in this segment and they're quick um you know and they're really light they're really nimble but this one felt just much quicker than everything else i think it's just that inline six is just so good from bmw so i'm glad you brought the inline six up uh from bmw because i had this question recently because i was thinking about you know if i'm toyota why did i choose to partner with bmw to make the new supra especially when there's a couple of good rear wheel drive cars in lexus in the um rc and the lc and we also published another art article this week that um, explained Toyota chose BMW because, of course, the, the Supra has to have an inline six. Supras have always had an inline six engine going back to the 70s when they began. And uh, Toyota did not have one handy. BMW makes incredible inline six engines. So that's why they partnered uh, with BMW. But um, to me, I, you know, it's one thing to go to a company and get an engine, but they did a lot more than that. They got a whole platform and that platform dictated a lot about the car. For instance, at least eyeballing it, it looks smaller than the last generation Supra, the Mark IV that ended in 2002. So it, I, it really, the car to me has, has changed because it was built on a BMW platform into almost a, a, a different size, a different kind of car. What do you think? Do you think it, it was a good partnership, a smart move, or do you think the Supra has changed from what it, it's always been in order to kind of accommodate this partnership? I think it was a smart move. I'm not of the opinion that the inline six from BMW is the only engine that they could have used. Uh, 
I think Toyota makes some good engines in their other cars. Um, and I think if they really wanted to go all out and, you know, build a Supra from the ground up, they could have, and they could have done a, a really good job. But it's hard because that inline six is so damn good. Like every other car you, you drive with that inline six, uh, it's just impressive. And here it's just tuned perfectly for this car. A and that's really what they wanted to do, right? The whole reason they wanted an inline six was because of the lineage and because mm -hmm. the Supra has always been an inline six. So it made sense. And also they didn't want to spend, you know, crazy amounts of money to do their own inline six. One of the reasons though they gave was because, you know, they didn't, they didn't want to invest money in developing their own engine because a lot of their dollars for future development are going into electrification. That would have been an interesting prospect too, to have the Supra be launched as Toyota's first or one of their first all electric vehicles and, and to be an all electric sport coupe, kind of like the, you know, the Tesla Roadster was, you know, yeah. starting off with a, with a really superlative, you know, sports car aspirational product. But I mean, I can, I, I, I agree with you. Um, there's just so many ways they could have gone. And I'm, I always play the what if game of, you know, what if they had, what if they had built it on the Lexus LC, which is a great platform yeah. and would have made a great Supra as well. And, um, you know, yes, I agree. It, it should have an inline six, but was that the most important thing to hang on to versus other things? Right. Um, so now one of the other criticisms they've gotten because of the tie up with BMW is there are BMW parts in this car that remind you that you're not really driving a Toyota. Um, in particular, let, let's see if we can list the ones in the interior. There's the not only the the like the navigation screen, but like the whole infotainment system is uh, BMW's iDrive, just kind of skinned um, with Toyota colors and whatnot yeah. and and logos. Um, the shifter that's from a BMW, mm -hmm. um, which is a very distinct shifter <laughs> that yeah. BMW uses. That like digital shifter that looks like a like a normal shifter, but it's really just the stock. You you move back and forth. What else is there? I think there's a couple more things that stood out the... that they pulled over. Well, you mentioned iDrive. The touchscreen is the same. The digital instrument cluster is not exactly the same as the Z4, but I think it's also a BMW part. I think it's a little smaller. You get the door chime when you open the door. You know, the beep uh, yeah. is the BMW <laughs> beep. Yeah, it's it's glaring. I mean, from an enthusiast standpoint, right, and from a from an auto rider standpoint, you look at that and say, that's a BMW. But... The bigger picture is it's a really nice interior. Whoever whoever's badge is on it, whoever's materials are on it, and the people who buy this car probably won't care, right? They'll say that's a nice interior and that's it. But since it is an enthusiast car and a lot of enthusiasts do read about cars all day long, I think there's going to be an equal sized group or maybe even a larger group that does know and it's always going to be in the back of their head that that this is a a kind of a, a Frankenstein BMW car, not a pure Toyota um, product. Right. Um, but you're right. If you're going to partner with somebody, why not? I mean, BMW is a great choice because pretty much everything they make is is high quality in terms of design and and build quality and all of that. I will say, you know, I've looked at pictures of both of them, the, the Z4 interior and the Supra interior, and it's completely unfair to say that the Supra has a BMW interior. Like it looks completely different yeah. from the Z4 interior. It's a completely different interior design. It's just that these individual components, uh, um, many of which are touch points, they are things that you interact with all the time. The, some of those things are BMW parts and that just kind of cracks the illusion a little bit that you're driving a, a purely Toyota product. Um, but yeah, to me, it's not a deal breaker. What, what, it, what could be a deal breaker for me is this news that we got. We asked Toyota and, and I don't even know how, it, how this was asked. Um, was, was it you who asked them about Apple CarPlay or, or, or you were in the conversation with them about it? Yeah. So I was discussing, uh, the technology with one of their, um, tech guys who sort of handled all this stuff for Supra. And just off the top of my head, I remembered BMW now charges people a, an annual fee for CarPlay subscription on top of, you know, the option of adding CarPlay already. That's insane. I, yeah. I BMW has the most frustrating, annoying pricing strategy for its options. This being the worst, and and to to make you not only buy the ability to use Apple CarPlay, but then charge you a yearly subscription to access it is like it's like double dipping, and it's it's so annoying. So yeah. so. 
you were talking to them about it. Yeah, and so I asked about if if they were planning on, you know, ripping off the BMW subscription thing and using it on Supra, and their their answer was, we're not sure yet, which is kind of scary. I don't know if I'd say scary because eighty bucks a month is not like the end of the world or eighty bucks eight, a year. Wait, Sorry. Eighty bucks a year. Yeah. yeah, it's not the end of the world, but I feel like. Like, okay, BMW can get away with that. But if you're Toyota, like, you should just, you shouldn't even think about that. You should say no. <laughs> like, well, like, we're not going to do that. I'll say they're probably thinking about it because the Supra is such a high price relative to everything else that they sell, right? I think they they think they can tap into a market of consumers that are willing to pay more for this car. So why aren't they willing to pay more for Apple CarPlay every year, you know? I mean, that, that may be true. There may be plenty of people out there willing to pay that, but... To, if I were running that company, I wouldn't want the image of us charging that. Um, personally, I think that's the image that uh, that's the kind of thing that gives BMW the image of being the worst people on the on the road yeah. um, who drive <laughs> BMWs. Like, like it, it's one of those things where it's just like you're 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 intentionally kind of sc- screwing your customers, and your reason for doing it is that they'll let you mm-hmm. and and. So I'm I'm not a big fan of that. I hope I they will, don't. I mean, yeah, I will say this though. To Toyota's credit, they've done a really good job of even though the Supra and the Z4 share, you know, the same platform, all the same components. Toyota really isn't nickel and diming you elsewhere. So you have two trims, the 3.0 and the 3.0 Premium, and with the Premium, you get pretty much everything you need. You know, wireless CarPlay, all kinds of other stuff, the 8-inch screen or 8.8-inch screen, and then I think the only options really are like the active safety stuff. Other than that, there's there's not a ton of options that can you know push the price into seventy seventy five grand, uh, which you, which you so, might see with the Z four. So so that's good. Um, I hope. And to be fair, you know they said they're thinking about it. They didn't say they're going to do it. Right. I just hope they. I hope they decide not to. I think that would be a really bad look and a bad precedent. Let's talk a little bit about the last Supra. Um, the last Supra, the Mark IV, ended production in two thousand two. Legendary. The fact it was so revered and so good, um, I think, is what led to 15 years of people begging and hoping that Toyota would revive it. At the same, that's a double-edged sword because now, with the new one here, all anybody wants to do is compare old to new. And and let's actually let let's talk a little bit about how revered the old one was. If you can find a low mileage, perfectly stock twin turbo supra mark IV supra auctions for those are going for 70 80 90 thousand dollars over a hundred thousand dollars for these cars first of all there's so few of them left because they were prime candidates for um, aftermarket tuning um, especially because of the the fast and furious movie franchise but so there's very few that are unmolested and i think the second reason uh, they're so revered is because th- that particular engine in the Mark IV Supra, it, it defined the word bulletproof. The the bottom end of that engine can take thousands of horsepower when tuned correctly. And there are Supras of that era modified for drag racing that are pumping out insane amounts of power because that engine is so strong. Now, I have never driven a Mark IV Supra. That's uh, one of my uh, disappointments in life. Have you ever uh, been behind the wheel of one? No, I've been in one. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I would go to all these car meets and there was always one or two sitting around. They were, they mostly looked terrible because there were some stupid mods done to them. Uh, and to your point, yeah, you, you really can't find any unmolested versions anymore. And from the passenger seat, it feels, you know, stupid quick and... It feels very much like a like a tuner car that has a big cult following. Even Toyota recognizes that the Fast and Furious movie propelled that car to to what it is. Uh, in in their presentation, they they put up a little slide that you know was oh really sort of, yeah <laughs> they honored was, they honored uh. Fast and Furious and that and that Supra and that movie because before the year I don't know when that movie came out early two thousands before then the Supra was kind of just like a cult classic with the tuners uh and then it just spawned into this new thing and uh that's really why they they wanted to bring it back because of that movie in a big part which is crazy the mark four was has gone for one hundred and twenty thousand and and up really perfect low mileage example yeah that's crazy for a 90s japanese sports car that's crazy 
from a nostalgic perspective. I think the the fourth gen super looks cool, but at the time the styling was bland. I mean, it was oh, yeah. it was a it was bland and a little weird with that giant wing on the back that you could eat, eat lunch off of. Yeah. Um, it was such a strange design. Um, well, and... I say in terms of '90s sports car, I think the NSX looks a lot better, right? And it was a better performer at the time. Um, well, the well the NSX or because I put it in the class back then of the 300 ZX right. and the and the RX7. I would put the NSX a class above the Supra and the rest of those. Yeah, I guess the, my point is just that even though it was you know a, a class above, the NSX doesn't have nearly the same cult following. I don't think. And no, and you're right, and, and it's probably because because the Supra was both in Fast and Furious, but also because at the time you could pick them up for a hell of a lot cheaper than you could uh, uh, used NSX. You know, it, they were just more accessible uh, as well. Yeah, and its competitors from the time, the RX-7 and the and the 300Z have not had nearly the same amount of popularity over the years as the Supra. It really was that movie and kind of pop culture that just catapulted it. You know, I don't I don't really see that happening with the new Supra. I don't know if to- Toyota has some um, some Dwayne Johnson backed movies uh, planned yeah, for the Supra. I meant to ask that and I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been great if they had gotten the rock there. It's crazy to think that that ended in 2002 and we waited 17 years for a new Supra. And I think they started showing Supra concepts as soon as 2007, which is like how long we've been teased with this you know, with the hope of the Supra coming back. And we've written reports before about Toyota sports car strategy. And, and right now it's got the, um, the, the 86, um, which is, you know, the four cylinder rear wheel drive sports car, uh, which is a great car. That's my, might be my most favorite car in terms of handling and accessibility. I know there's, uh, you know, much more expensive cars that, that handle great too, but I just, I love driving, uh, the GT 86. So that's one. The Supra is now the second, and we've reported in the past that there's going to be a third, and that will slot above um, the Supra. And to me, I think the the LC500 from Lexus it really is a great platform for that. Something V8 powered, maybe. Although, God, this day and age, everyone's dropping V8s left and left and right because of um, electrification and emissions and all that. So. Who knows if if they could get away with a, a V eight powered uh, sports car, but who and, and uh, you know they've still got the the two thousand GT to um, link back to if they wanted to for like a, a super sports car uh, if they went that route. That's all speculation though. I don't have any inside knowledge of of what they're going to do next, but I think the LC five hundred would make a great platform for that. Initially, when the eighty six came out, well, it was a Scion FRS. First, which right. rest in peace, Sion. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, initially, when that came out, I asked why they didn't call it a Celica. And I guess their answer was that it was, you know, a joint project with Subaru and it wasn't a pure Toyota, so they couldn't really revive that nameplate. I mean, I guess Supra isn't really the same thing. Yeah, I guess they don't mind that so, with a Supra. <laughs> or maybe uh, I like to think that maybe they turned a corner, right? And maybe they're like, okay, people just want the name, right? So maybe they'll bring back Celica on the 86 and maybe they'll make a high performance 2000 GT and they'll have all three of those cars. And that would be awesome. <laughs> that would be, it, it's, it's interesting that you bring up Celica because in the, in like the eighties and the late seventies, like the Celica and the Supra were completely intertwined. I mean, the Celica was basically a version of the, or sorry, the Supra was basically a version of the Celica. The Supra was just like the high performance six cylinder version of the Celica. And uh, in high school in the nineties, I bought a 1984 Toyota Celica. I think it was a GTS and it was basically the Supra of the time. So it had these really wide fender flares. It had this, the louvers on the back. It looked incredibly boss. And the only difference between it and the Supra was really the, the fact that it had a four cylinder and the Supra had, had the six cylinder. And God, I loved that car. It was, it looked incredible. It was the only car I owned during high school. And I, and I owned a lot of sub $1,000 cars during high school. I kind of went through them like they were um, disposable cars. Um, but it was the only car I ever had in high school that like an underclassman walked by, uh, and was like, you know, whose, whose car is that? That's sweet. And I was like, you know, standing by listening. 
Um, unfortunately, that car met an untimely end when I pulled left in a turn in front of somebody and totaled it. So, but it was a Toyota, so I walked away and was was perfectly fine. Um, you know, three cheers for safety. Um, but yeah, I so it would be it would be interesting. I would love to have the Celica name back too. Um, I think Toyota has not traded on its past um, as much as it could. You know, some automakers, sla- you know, <laughs> slavishly like give us the nostalgia. You know, like the Volkswagen Beetle and, yeah. and all this other us. stuff. Yeah. Eclipse. Wow, well, that's just uh, that's the worst one. That's that's a crime. Yeah, I mean, just a. It's a shame too because the Eclipse was also a cool car in the nineties. Oh, it was amazing. It was, but uh, Mitsubishi doesn't want to even be making cars anymore. So, but to take that name and that nostalgia and attach it to a crossover, that's that is criminal. That's that's violating the trust you have uh, with your uh, fans uh, on the value of that kind of nostalgic name. Um, so yeah, that one that one's a bummer. But Toyota doesn't do it as often, and I feel like they they could. Um, so I'm I'm eager to to drive one myself. Hopefully we'll get one for um and I'm talking about the super now. Hopefully we'll get one for a week long review soon and maybe we can even do uh, a comparison whether it's with the Z4 or with a competitor. Speaking of which, what what are the competitors of the new Supra? So they highlighted Porsche Cayman and BMW M2 were like one and two competitors. Uh which I think is kind of funny. M2 is a competitor when it's a ZM when it's a BMW shared platform with a different BMW. So yeah, well the the BMW Z4 that it shares the platform with and the engine does it, it has a more powerful version of the engine. So I think yeah. it makes 380 some horsepower, mm-hmm. but it's actually I don't think it's f- uh, any faster at all. So the the power doesn't doesn't benefit the Z4 much. But but yeah, that is funny that they would they would pitch it against uh, a different bmw maybe that was part of the deal uh when they became partners was that you you know we're not going to compete out in the open market uh between the z4 and the supra if you also want to look at like jaguar f-type or chevy corvette those are sort of outlier competitors i guess i think i think those are fair at least at least they're like base models you know with their base engines yes Mm -hmm. you know obviously a zr1 is not a comparison for the supra but a base corvette stingray maybe I also think, even though it's ancient, um, the Nissan 370Z oh, cool. um, could be as well. Uh, yeah. it, like I said, it, it's it is on, it is past its last leg. <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe maybe you 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 know get a Nismo and and put it against the Supra. I I want to think that it's a competitor because it's like the only other Japanese sports car that survived. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'd be a fun comparison. Maybe we'll do that comparison. It's probably really easy to get Nissan to give us a 300 ZX, 370 ZX lying around. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I, that era of Japanese uh, sports car, rear wheel drive sports cars in the in the 90s was just, it was epic. I loved that. All right. Well, we would love to hear what you think about the Supra. As a matter of fact, if you have suggestions of what we should compare it against, uh, let us know. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com. Um, and the discussion that we're having now will continue over there. And of course, on our website, motorone.com, where you can find us in the comments of the first drive of the Supra, as well as all the other articles we're writing about uh, the Supra this week. Coming up, we're going to find out what Jeff and I have been driving this week. Before the break, though, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, So why not hit the subscribe button now so you never miss a show? Welcome back. During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And Jeff, why don't you tell me what you've been behind the wheel of? I am driving the new and improved Hyundai Elantra Sport. Hyundai Elantra Sport. Now, the Hyundai Elantra Sport was recently redesigned. And I I would argue that the last generation Sport was a good looking compact car. It was very good looking. They redesigned it and it's Honestly, I can't remember a time when a car took a step backwards in attractiveness with a redesign. And I really feel like the Elantra did. Like, I don't think, I think the new Elantra looks like the 1998 Elantra. Like, like it looks like it should have a 1990 in front of its um, model year. Um, but what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. I, what's funny is I was driving home yesterday and uh, 
a last gen Elantra Sport pulls past me. And I think, oh, that's a good looking car. And then I remember, wait, I'm in the new one and this one's worse looking. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what they were doing there. Well, is, so it, it may not look as good as a last gen one, but what is it like as a car like to drive and its features? Did it take a step forward? Oh, yeah. It's super fun to drive. Um, you know, I guess if you compare this against GTI, uh, Civic Si, it might not be better than those two. Um, dynamically, I guess it's a little more roly poly and not as quick, uh, but it feels good. I mean, there's there's really nothing I can say negative about the way it drives. Uh, I guess if you're looking for something a little cheaper than those two, um, this is a good solid option. Yeah, and there, I, I, you know, I was gonna say there's a there's a place for that in the market, but then I kind of caught myself because uh, th- those places in the market are really drying up for passenger cars. Like, um, you know, this is Hyundai, and I give Hyundai tons of credit for the new Sonata uh, that they launched. That looks amazing. It's one of the most beautiful four door sedans, in my opinion, on sale today. Uh, but then the, you know, they do this to the Elantra. And, you know, then you look at, okay, well, it's a sport version of it. And it's like, uh, I really don't know how many they're going to move out the door. Uh, Because I feel like anyone who goes into a Hyundai dealership to buy an Elantra probably doesn't care about a sport version. They're probably buying a a car for their, you know, child in college or or something like that. Yeah, Um, it's the. I feel like this is a weird mid-cycle refresh that's going to result in a, a much better next generation, sort of like the Sonata. Um, but it's, it's okay. It's fine. I mean, if I, like I said, it starts, it starts at 22, six. So if you want something cheaper than a GTI or a Civic SI, which I think the Civic is a little closer in price, uh, this isn't bad, but to your point, yeah, not a lot of people are going to walk in and be like, I want the Elantra sport. They're going to want the cheapest Elantra with you right. know, whatever base options and safety stuff for their kid that they can get. And I, and I think the regular Elantra is great for that. Um, but yeah, I question how many sports they're going to move. Um, so, well, I've been, I have a little, I've had a little bit more interesting car in my driveway, uh, to drive this week. I've had the Lexus LC 500, uh, which I mentioned, had a chance to mention earlier in the podcast in regards to the, to the Supra. Um, and I kind of went full circle with this car when I got it. Well, first of all, my, my expectation before it arrived was I'm going to love this car. For one, it looks incredible in pictures, like, and that's where I'd mainly been been seeing it. It looks like a concept car come to life with nothing changed on its way to production. Um, and everything I've read about it in terms of how it drives and the power, all been good. So it comes and they drop it off and I walk outside and I realize that in pictures it looks one way, but when you get up close to it, some details stand out as not really being that great or attractive uh, in particular. Uh, I was focusing in my, uh, when I was taking it all in on the rear end and particularly the rear tail lights. Um, There's this material they use in the rear tail lights that is like a chrome, but it's like a textured bumpy chrome. And it's, I mean, it's not chrome, it's plastic. So it's, it's such a weird material and texture and um, kind of like reflection, reflective surface to use. I don't get it at all. It, it looks, it reminds me of like, um, um, you remember those model toys that you'd used to get and like the the plastic chrome that the pieces would be on that you had to break the pieces off to let them create the model. It reminds me of that, like that kind of plastic chrome. Um, and then the tail edge themselves are this weird kind of they they almost look like there's nothing in them until they light up. Um, and I don't know. I just so so some of the details on closer expect inspection like did not impress me. Do you also have the the ugly chrome wheels on this one? Did I? Um, let me check. I don't. I don't think so. The one we had down here in Miami uh, for a week, I felt the same way. That the it's almost as if like designers showed the car to executives right minus all the chrome and tackiness and they're like this is it and the execs were like yeah that's cool but it needs way more chrome because old people love chrome right (laughs) because we're lexus and we can never forget that yeah Yeah. 
Uh, no, I'm looking at I'm looking at the pictures I took of it right now, and it did not have uh, mine. Did not have the chrome wheels. It had these kind of two tone wheels. Mo- they're mostly like a normal kind of silver, and then some black spokes on it as well. Um, now, it, it, the, here's the thing, though. I had the car for a week, and by the end of the week, I was I had come full circle, and I was completely smitten again with its looks. It really, it, it's. It's the best Lexus design on sale right now. And unfortunately, that's not a, a high bar because Lexus design is is uh, really whack right now. <laughs> like their, their SUVs, the, the RX in particular. I mean, that grill has just gone insane. But I feel like the expression of what they want their design to be is is most clearly and attractively expressed on the LC. It's like it was designed to be on that car first and has been adapted to all the others. Um, and man, it turned heads wherever I went, um, not only because of its looks, but because of the engine note and the engine note is, uh, glorious. It is, I could, I could dig my foot into that accelerator and listen to that all day. Um, so I, I loved the way it drives. Um, I mean, this is a real kind of gentleman's GT. Like I could drive it every day, but it felt, um, you know, fast as a, as a supercar. It, it kind of was, you know, it's funny you bring up Miami because I actually thought about snowbirds in Miami and, you know, older gentlemen being like, well, this is the car I'm going to drive around as my status symbol. Um, it, I, that doesn't sound like a compliment, <laughs> but, but, but that's how I, I mean, you, I, you can't deny what Lexus, you know, what their, um, traditional demographic has been in the past so yeah oh, um, no, that's completely true too because the amount of lexus vehicles that they sell down here is you know yeah you crazy. get the you, you get the wife the rx and then you get the lc for yourself yeah, exactly. i mean that's the kind of thing i that i thought of um i i still though cannot forgive it for having the lexus infotainment system which i will with my dying breath claim as the worst infotainment system on sale today in any car um, and it's it's equally horrific in this. Um, it looks terrible. It's difficult to use. It's distracting to use. Um, and honestly, I, per, and this is me personally, like I can say so many good things about Lexus vehicles, but I could not purchase one for myself because I could not deal with that infotainment system on a daily basis. I would it would just infotainment systems are used all the time. You're always with them. You're always looking at them. And I just could not handle that, uh, day in and day out. But, um, but yeah, and the price came in just a smidge under a hundred thousand. It was like 90, uh, 97, I think here, wait, I might have it here. It was as tested out the door, 96, 940 with a base price of 92, 200. So that's steep. You can get a lot of other cars for ninety two, uh, ninety to one hundred thousand dollars, but um, but yeah, this uh, the five liter V eight is just it's, it was just a great. Uh, that's why when I was driving it and and I was reading your first drive of the Supra, I was just like, oh, this would be great if it were a Supra, <laughs> you know, yeah. like if it was like a four hundred horsepower Supra. Uh, but I again, I understand the reasons. No, no inline six to use in it and all of that. But yeah, well, the LC is much of a is much more of a touring car too. Right, you could drive that thing every day. I, I put it on par with the GTR and maybe the NSX a little bit to where it's like, you can buy this and this could be your only car. You could be totally fine with it. You know, if you're a retiree or, you know, yeah, that's young, true. You know, a young rich dude or whatever. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's more of a touring car though. So Supra is different, but they're both really good cars still. Yeah, I actually put the. You know, it's funny that we were we, we said the. Um, Corvette and what was the other one up there? Uh, oh, the, the Jaguar F Type yeah. could be could be competitors for the Supra. I also think they're competitors for the LC five hundred, yeah, um, as well. Um, so, um, but no, it was a good week. I mean, it's always a good week when people are giving you a thumbs up when you drive by and something. Uh, and I got a few of those with the Lexus. So, um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Um, you can follow Jeff on Twitter at Not a Boat Captain. And I am at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, thank you for joining me, Jeff. I appreciate it. It was just you and me since you were with the, the Supra. So thanks for helping me carry the load. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you all about there for listening. And we'll see you next week.